Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, as uh, Jessica introduced, I'm Dr. Jose Colon, uh, um, founder of uh, Paradise Sleep, which is a website that gives sleep health information. We also write uh, children's books. And um, I, it's interesting how I found my, my path through sleep and through uh, stress management, and uh, I find the story to be interesting. Um, I originally went to medical school to, to be a general pediatrician. Uh, I've always loved kids, I love science, and that's what I wanted to do, and uh, I was very passionate about it. In medical school, however, I, I found that it was difficult for me to give parenting advice when I wasn't a, a parent at the time. <laughs> and um, just something, um, there was a, also an interest that I started to develop in, in neurology, and I decided to, to run with it. And I did a, a child neurology uh, fellowship, and I did that at, at Vanderbilt. And over at Vanderbilt, the Department of Sleep Medicine was through the Department of Neurology. So that, you know, I went to USF and lived in Tampa all my, uh, all my life and then went over there. And just being in a, it was a great place, but being in a different setting caused a certain degree of, of stress as well and a certain degree of, of sleep issues at the same time that I got my first exposure to sleep. And I really enjoyed learning about sleep and I ran with that. And then in my practice of, of sleep medicine, as well as child neurology, I was finding that there was a lot of things that, that we were treating that wasn't always getting better. And I realized that it's because we're not getting to the underlying roots and many times stress-based disorders, and unless you're getting to, to the roots of the stress, many things kind of continue and perpetuate. So that's just an interesting thing on how I uh, came to, to learn about sleep and stress. I always uh, talk about disclosures. Um, I say I, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I'm not hired by any pharm pharmaceutical companies. I'm employed by Lee Memorial Health System in Fort Myers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I do have a, a website and I uh, write books and, and we're gonna give out uh, six books today randomly. And I always say that if I have one conflict of interest, it's that I am a father and I'm a husband and I, I hope that the message that I'm trying to give makes this world a better place for them as well. So I, I really don't read a lot of slides word for word. It's not what I do, but this one is important. And stress in, to, uh, so stress in today's world, mood problems are increasing so fast that by 2020 they will outrank AIDS, accidents, and violence as the primary causes of early death and disability. And signs that stress may be affecting your mood may include worry, feeling overwhelmed, concentration problems, cravings for chocolate or wine, and <laughs> insomnia. And, and, and it was the insomnia one that started this, uh, started this journey, that I, I realized that there was a population that I was really trying to help with appropriate medical therapy that just was not responding to it. And that's when I started to kind of learn a little bit more about stress-based disorders. So how can we learn to overcome stress? What I hope that y'all will do is at the end of the day get a box, and the reason is because we come from cavemen. And I always hear a pause afterwards, and people are scratching their heads. But this is true, and when you want to learn to improve something, help something, overcome something, you have to understand the origins of where the problem comes from. And the answer lies in Kmart. And whether you believe that we came from evolution or believe that we came from a rib, which my wife makes really good ribs, but that's besides the point. <laughs> um, there's no denying that there's art in caves. And there was a time, you know, we've had electricity for 100, 200 years, but before that, we were around for millions and millions of years. And there was a time that the world um, consisted of, of, of hiding and fighting. And it was a, a barbaric time where the average caveman lived to be about 20 years of age. And the, one of the things that this, this book uh, that I read, Buddha's Brain, talked about is that our ancestors that lived, in order to live during this uh, barbaric time, they had to be really agitated, really angry, quick to, quick to fight, or they had to be really anxious and quick to, to flee or just to avoid any type of, of scary conflict. Um, there were always different bands of tribes and, um, and different animals out to get you. 
So the, there was a, a, a brutish kind of barbaric world and one out of every 10 cavemen died of a, a barbaric death, whereas during the World War areas, uh, one out of 1,000 a, a uh, men died of, of war. Well, this caveman always had a choice to make, you know, and, and they had a, to, to make a, one of two mistakes. They could either make the mistake of believing that there was an animal in a bush when in fact there wasn't. And the consequence to this mistake is just senseless agitation. Or they could believe that there was no animal in the bush and just kind of relax when in fact there was. And the consequence to this was death. So we were hardwired over millions and millions of years to make the mistake of senseless agitation for survival just to m not make this mistake one time. And understanding that our, our brain is very good at learning and absorbing bad experiences and not as good as learning from, from good experiences, um, the news industry understands this. And that's why uh, the majority of, of the news starts off with the latest homicide or tragedy is because they have a saying that says, if it bleeds, it leads. They know that our brain has a tendency towards negativity, kind of like uh, Velcro. but many of the positive stuff just kind of slide off, kind of like um, t a Teflon pan, a nonstick pan. You know, interesting, one day my son, when he was five and I was taking him home from BPK on the way home, he goes, Dad, when we go home, can we watch the news? And I told him, no, son, the news is too violent. We're going to watch Power Rangers instead. <laughs> <laughs> so understanding that um, our, our brain has this tendency towards negativity, um, we have to, you know, if we take a look at our, our brain and see that the, the soil of our brain has more, um, is more fertile for weeds of negativity than they are for flowers of positivity, we can approach our brain in one of three ways. One thing we can do is just leave it alone and accept it. And if we do that, we have to understand that weeds of negativity are just going to outgrow that. Another thing that we can do is uh, pull some weeds, you know, so we can pull weeds of negativity. Well, you know, you can't always go back and change life experiences, but you can uh, make sense of things that happen. You can reduce the amount of negativity that's around us. Uh, we can choose to hang out with, with positive people. I always say that, um, I give two examples. You know, Winnie the Pooh, he has a choice. He can have lunch with Eeyore or Tigger. And Smurfette, I mean, she could choose to, to date Grouchy or, or Hefty. Now, I'm not saying that, that Grouchy and, and, and Eeyore don't need friends, but we don't also have to uh, absorb and internalize their, their negativity as well. Another option that we can do is that we can learn to, to build flowers of positivity, and we'll talk about a couple of these today. So I always say, let good feelings ease you to sleep. And, and before you go to sleep, we have a tendency to reverberate. Whatever the last thing that you think about just kind of reverberates in our mind. And make uh, an emphasis to think of something positive before you go to sleep. We have a natural tendency towards the other. Let's say 10 great things happen to you, but one bad thing happened. What do we have a tendency to bring to us? <laughs> that negative. I see a lot of heads nodding. Yeah, the negative. Um, making an effort to Think of something positive before you go to sleep is already one thing that we can do to build positivity. And that's my <coughs> son and daughter there. So get a box. I said at the end of the day, I want you all to get a box. Yeah, so let's get a box. And at the end of every single day, write something positive that occurred. And you know, we may leave here, and there could be an apocalypse, and zombies can come out. But you know what? We've had a couple uh, good laughs today. We can write that down. Hey, you know, we had a couple good laughs today. And then at the end of a month, whether it's on New Year's or an anniversary or whatever, at the end of a month, go back and read all of these flowers of positivity that you have grown within that month. And. This is something that we can do within marriages as well. And I did this with my wife where for a full month, you know, she wrote down something positive about me. I wrote down something positive about her. You know, families and, and marriage, they could be stressful. Sometimes, you know, we don't see eye to eye, which normally means that I'm wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we did this. And at the end of the month, it was like, you know what? We, ha we have our, our, our challenges and life is, is uh, tough at times. But look at all these beautiful things that 
that we've done over the past uh, over the past month, and it really helps build the relationship. And you can do this with kids as well. Um, if they can't write something down, have them draw something. And, and drawing for kids is is you know one drawing for a kid is a paragraph. You know, it's a story, and this does calm them down as well. And I wouldn't wait the end of a month for a kid. I would say at the end of a week, go back and read all of the flowers of positivity that, that you've uh, developed, that you've cultivated. Um, hey, there were challenges during the week, Sunday night, let's read all these. Wow, this is what we have to look forward to in the next upcoming week. And um, good feelings and drawings, as I said, calm people down and ease people to, to, to sleep through stimulating the creativity type of side. And we'll talk about the science behind that in a little bit. <laughs> and uh, social media is, can work either way for you. Um, I, I had a patient one time tell me, wow, you are so positive. I bet you're not on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, actually, uh, I am. Um, but there's you know, times that a lot of negative stuff is, is out there, and you don't have to follow those people. You don't have to put them in, in your news line. A and you can have different pockets of, of friends or societies or whatever that, that, that you're spreading positive thoughts as well. Um, I have one particular channel that every day I just try to say something positive and at the end of the month I'll go back and I'll read the different uh, flowers of positivity that we've grown and hopefully some of these flowers of positivity are growing with others as well. So allowing good to sink into us. Um, good many times is like that oil <laughs> on water that it never really kind of sinks in. The bad has a tendency to kind of, like if you put a food coloring drop, just kind of seep into that water. Uh, we have a tendency to internalize the, the, the bad that occurs. But we can learn to take in the good as well. There's a, a million positive things that are, that are out there. Um, winning the lottery, the birth of a child, graduating, these are all wonderful positive things, but there's little small positive things that, that are good every single day. And one thing that I like to do is take an orange. And uh, those of you who want to, that have an orange, you can go ahead and do this. And just take one moment, I love doing this, and dig your thumb into it and smell that orange oil. And just kind of stay with it for 10 seconds. How many times do we grab an orange and just consume it and, and, and not smell that? This scent, it's, it's good. It smells really nice. And uh, it, it brings a, a smile to my face. And then after uh, peeling the orange, take one piece at a time and feel every contour in it. Feel every juice that, that comes out. Um, stay with it and eat one piece at a time, not fumbling with the, with the next piece. And you know, there's a little bit of science behind this. One thing right off bat is when you go to smell that, your uh, the smelling nerves or olfactory nerves. The names are not important, but there's a, a communication that that occurs to that nerve that goes to our limbic system. That name is not important. The concept is is that it's our emotional area, and and sense can uh, produce emotions, and that's why. Walking into a house of baking cookies smells good, gives you a heartwarming feeling. And also, when something's bad, you, ooh, you ever heard the term, oh, I smell a rat? <laughs> you know? um, and this is something that is being used a lot in, in, the, in aroma, aromatherapy and essential oils. And, and yeah, the citrus can be invigorating and it, and it makes me smile when you think about it. And smiling makes you feel good. And we'll talk about the science behind that as well. So. This, just a simple process of taking orange, of taking something that's positive is, is something that I learned in Hardwiring Happiness called HEAL, where you have a moment. So go out and, and give yourself a moment, whether it's an orange or a massage or, or exercise or meditation, anything. Give yourself a moment, um, enrich it, stay with it, absorb it, let it uh, feel that heartwarming smile, um, and then Optional is we can link positive to negative material. Um, so if something bad happened, you know, think about the positive instead, and we'll give examples. Now I, I take this a, a step further and say healed. Uh, don't kick yourself. The D is for don't kick yourself. Watch out for those ants. 
those ants are, are automatic negative thoughts. And these automatic negative thoughts can, can crush our, our human spirit more than any disease uh, can. And we, and we have a tendency to talk in those. You know, why am I always late? How come I can't do this? You know, um, around the time that I was learning this, I remember that I was taken on a project. And uh, I was the, the chief of the project. It was something that I've never done before. And I said, I don't know what I'm doing. And I go, whoa, that was an ant. So I actually wrote it down. I don't know what I am doing. I put a line through it. And then I wrote down, I have taken on new projects before. I have been successful in most projects. And I didn't lie to myself. It was true. The lie was that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> that was the ant. And all of these will help with our feelings, emotions, and moods. <coughs> and uh, emotions, they consist of, of feelings and moods. And feelings are quick. They are brought together by some kind of stimulus. Moods linger. They hover. And feelings brew moods. If you're feeling good, you're going to have a good mood. If things are happening and you're feeling bad, that's going to bring a, a bad mood. And we have this um, window of consolidation. Let, let me just say that the more positive things that you're searching for, the more I'm going to enrich this orange, or hey, I turned something in on time, you know, great. The more pats on the back, the, the, the more positive experiences that we can accumulate, the more positive mood that we're going to have. But when something happens, we do have in our brain neuronal firing of different areas where that negative feeling brews into that negative mood. And it's been shown that if when something, when you proverbially stub your toe, when something bad happens, if within a one hour period you find a positive feeling, it disrupts the neuronal firing of that negative mood uh, brewing. So again, around the time that I was learning this, there was a day that it was pretty tough for me to get out of the house. Um, you know, there's drama, I got two kids, you know, and, and you always want your children to, to thrive. That's why you do what you do. But sometimes with, with there's tantrums or difficulties, you're just trying to survive a particular moment. And one mo moment, it was, it was tough. And on my way uh, to work, I felt that negative feeling just brewing, hovering into that negative mood. And I said, whoa. So I stopped at Publix. I got an orange. <laughs> <laughs> and I healed. I stayed with it uh, one bit at a time and then I went back to work and I had a great day. That negative mood never developed. Um, when we got home we still addressed the things that, that we needed to address and we had a great day. And from time to time when I proverbially stub my toe or you know you're dealing with uh, whether it's a client or, or anything that's negative, <coughs> hey taking a moment to step away and have an orange or whatever it is that you want to have, um, having the rest of the day in positivity is going to be more productive than letting the, the negative self-talk continue. So this was the perfect day to do this. So the other day, on a day like today, you know, there was a day that I, I looked out and I said, wow, it looks gloomy out there. And the moment that I said that it looked gloomy, whoa, I started to feel gloomy. I said, you know what? It is not as hot as it is on a normal Florida day. And I took a moment to listen to the sound of the raindrops and the wind going through the palm trees. And you know, you just try to find a ray of positivity in every day. And when you do this, you're not choosing to live life looking through rose-tinted glasses. You're just choosing not to look at them through our smudge-tinted crack glasses that we have a tendency to look at them through. So how else can we learn to overcome stress? bring out our inner child. Everyone's got bubbles. And let's go ahead and take the bubbles out and let's blow on them 10 times. Ten. And I'll do the counting. Nine. And look at all the colors on those bu bubbles. Eight. And look at your reflection within the bubbles. Seven. Six. That's right. It is. Four. Three. Two. 
two. And one. Excellent. Excellent. So, I see smiles. If anyone wants to go ahead and take a picture and post it on Facebook, you know, a little selfie with the, the bubbles. <laughs> so, I, I heard that within the company there's been a, a, a lot of change going on. Have you all been thinking about that while you were blowing the bubbles? No. No? Were you thinking about your morning this morning? No. no? Okay. And like I said, you know, I, I, I see a lot of smiles. I, I see shoulders that are a little bit more relaxed than what they were a moment ago. <laughs> So what did we do? I said that we were going to talk some mind-blowing science. And just like you have a heart rate, you have a brain rate. Just like you have electrical activity that makes your heart have a, a beat and rhythm, so too does our brain have a, a, a brain and rhythm as well. And what happens to your heart? What do you feel your heart do when you are agitated? Yeah. And what does your mind do? races it doesn't slow down you know it starts making up stories you know why does this person do this to me or you know um, well I learned this um, through sleep okay some people weren't responding to medications why well let's just say someone's in bed and they're not asleep and they're agitated that they're not asleep what's their heart gonna do what's their mind gonna do it doesn't allow it to slow down if you're thinking that you know, if you're anxious that you're going to be tired the next day, your heart's going to go up, your mind's going to, it's not, not going to be able to slow down. Well, a little bit of biology is when somebody inhales, your heart fluctuates, speeds up, but when you breathe out, the heart slows down. And if you take a minute, and we did much less than a minute, and we were breathing out slower than we were breathing in, the heart calms, and when the heart calms, the mind is able to calm as well. And here you can actually see some of this brain rate activity. You can see that the heart's beating faster, the brain's beating faster, the heart's slow, and then we are able to drift into a sleep state or into a, a, a relaxed state. So does this really work? Has, has anyone in here ever been to uh, a doctor? <laughs> Everyone? Okay. And have they ever written you a prescription, especially with the new electronic prescribing that goes straight to the pharmacy? Have they ever written you a prescription for a chicken? <laughs> no? Okay. Yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, chicken soup makes someone feel good. Well, why? I can assure you it's not the gluten or the high sodium load. <laughs> it's hot. You have to blow on it. So the breath, breathing, these are, you know, different types of breathing is something that's been intertwined through ages and through our society from martial arts to, to childbirth. And it's taking those deep exhalations that are calming. People will say, you know, warm milk puts you to sleep. Well, then a cafe latte should be illegal while you're driving. No, you're, 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 you're blowing on it, so that's a, a calming type of process. Have you ever heard the, the term, you know, passing the peace pipe? Once again, it's the exhalations. And it's a theory on why I have that, that it's difficult to quit smoking sometimes. It's because I'm, I've never really seen anyone that's addicted to nicotine. You know, I've seen people agitated with their nicotine gum during transcontinental flights. Why? Because they're not having the exhalation. And some of these electronic cigarettes, some of them don't even have nicotine. But it's the, it's the breathing out. It's the calming. So again, that's one of the theories that I have on why it's difficult to quit smoking. And because it's my theory, I know it's correct. <laughs> but this is the, the, the foundation of, of yogic breathing, mindful breathing, uh, slow breathing during uh, meditation. Now, another thing is that I told you to take a look at, at the colors. And when you do that, you see this halo within a halo within a halo. And one thing that it's impossible to do is you cannot picture a frown in any of those. So what do you do? You smile. And smiling makes you feel good. So the nerves of our muscles of facial expression, they come from our brainstem. And within our brainstem, there's connections to our limbic system. That name's not important, but it's our emotional area, as well as nerves that go down to our heart. And that's what gives us that heartfelt sensation. And interestingly, um, Thich Nhat Hanh and many other meditation masters, they say when you go through a meditation, to, to do it with a half smile. And there's a, a biology behind that. So there's a science behind that. But get it, I said that we were going to talk about mind-blowing science and we were blowing bubbles. And, <laughs> all right, so now it comes full circle. So you're going to want to do this with your kids. I know that um, one thing that I have to the caution is 
when kids start to blow bubbles, they have a tendency to get hyper and they want to pop them. So lay out a ground rule. Say, okay, we can blow the bubbles, but don't pop them. Instead, catch them. And you can see that. That's my son doing that right there. And now you're, you're developing skills of, of focused attention. I always keep bubbles in my car and uh, before school, you know, we'll, we'll do this sometimes. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so a tale of two brains. People say your brain. Well, that's like saying your lung or your kidney. Hopefully you have two. Um, and your left brain and your right brain are, are different. And interesting, as I was learning about left brain, right brain, uh, I like this definition that the author of The Whole Brain Child said about brain maturity. And she some mentioned something along the lines of, both of them mentioned along the lines that the, you know, her brain is maturing throughout the first year of life and she continues to fully mature th uh, throughout adulthood into her 20s. So by her definition, the, the male brain never really matures. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the left brain and the right brain and the left brain is logical it likes words it's our language area and it's a source of racing thoughts and then we have our, our right brain and it's creative it's imaginative visual spatial skills and when you have one side stimulated the other doesn't you know the, the other side doesn't work as well so when, when you have all this self-talk through your left brain you you're not able to find creative solutions on, on how to solve problems. But when we were doing the bubbles, that was a creative thing. And we increased our creativity, and we weren't thinking about a number of things that are encountering on every day, in our everyday world. And kids are born with such magical creativity, such wonderful creativity. You know, it's funny, my, my daughter, uh, the other day she couldn't find something, and she said, Santa Claus, take it. Well, Santa Claus doesn't take things. You know, he gives you stuff. He took the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kids are bored with such wonderful creativity. And then, you know, through, through the process of, of uh, systematic testing and, and uh, education, we sometimes educate the creativity out of them. And this is not a knock on our teachers at all. I mean, I'm just telling Jessica, I've seen just incredible uh, development in, in my son over the year. But this does happen. We, we uh, we need to promote creativity and arts and music in our children as well. So relaxation is a mental exercise. You know, sometimes it's hard to do, and we have to do it regularly. And sometimes it's hard to find a, a place to do it. Um, and sometimes not everyone's involved within the family of doing it. And I, I have this saying that walking a mile is not running a marathon. That makes sense. Of course, that's obvious, but now going back and saying relaxation is a mental exercise is the key word, okay? If you've never been to the gym before and then you walk in there and then someone tells you to go run 10 miles, well, that sucks. I may not come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, likewise, that's why I start with just bubbles is because you may be excited to do this and then you go out and get a one-hour CD. Well, that's a mental marathon. If you try to just sit by yourself for, for an hour, that's a mental marathon. We got to, you know, blowing the bubbles was the equivalent of, of, of stretching before a, a run. And then likewise, we may walk into a gym and we've never been there before. We get on this equipment, that equipment. Maybe you'll get fit, maybe you'll get hurt. Maybe you'll walk out and say, well, this wasn't for me. The same true is with, with relaxation exercises that uh, sometimes it's good to get a coach or uh, some kind of personal trainer that can help you with this. And the more that you do something, the, the better that you will get at it. The more that you do different uh, meditations or relaxation exercises, you build areas in your brain of, of compassion, of, of, of attention. And they've done these MRI scans on Buddhist monks as well as um, uh, Catholic nuns and there are areas of concentration and compassion that are thicker and areas of anxiety that are reduced when people do some of these exercises over eight week periods and brain is one of those things that you either use it or lose it and I believe this to be true that if every child were to be taught meditation that we would uh, eliminate uh, violence within one generation and I've been in different parts. I did a medical mission in a place that the right of manhood was that you had to serve in the military. And I remember getting currency exchange with this guy, this big dude with bulletproof vest and a shot off shotgun. 
And then I went to a, a, another place in, uh, when I did a travel in, in Asia, I went to Laos, and the city that we were in, the right of manhood over there is that the, the men, they had to spend three years, the, the child had to spend three years within the Buddhist monks, uh, Buddhist cemetery and, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, with the Buddhist monks, and they meditated, and the calm airness in that city was just surreal and it was before I even knew about the word mindfulness or meditation but it was one of the most um, calm and serene places that that I've ever been to and these are are my kids there <laughs> and it looks cute but this is actually also sleep avoiding behavior because I said all right kids time for go to bed you see they're in pajamas and they're like no dad we meditate <laughs> <laughs> So what is this about mindfulness? We hear about mindfulness, this and that over here. Now there's an app for that. Now there's an app for everything. Um, well, mindfulness is um, means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. What? <laughs> there's some things that are not very well defined, but they are experienced. If you ask me, you know, how, how do you describe a cantaloupe? Well, it's sweet. Well, so is an orange. Yeah, but an orange is citrus. Well, you know, an orange and a grapefruit are different. There's some things that you need to uh, experience. And we did that today. We did that with the, mo with, with the, with the bu bubbles. You know, we were mindful. That was a mindfulness of the bubbles. We were paying attention to them. And we also had a, something called a mental device, something to bring our attention back if our mind wanders. And our mental device was the, the counting, the counting down. And your mental device could be music, it could be different things, and, and mindfulness can be experienced through your breathing, through body scan meditations, through uh, anything. You could be mindful to anything, including your food. And that was with the orange, it's one of those things that it's a mindful eating. You're just paying attention to one thing, and it keeps your mind from racing, and when it does race, you bring it back to whatever it is that you are doing, your mental device. And that's one of the things that I do is through story and metaphor, I, I like to teach about sleep health and mindfulness skills and stress uh, reduction. So I am a, a storyteller, so I'm gonna tell one brief little story, okay? Um, once upon a time, there was a bird, a little bird, and the little bird lived in a forest, and he's had all these little forest friends, and one day, there was a fire. And the friends told the bird, hey, listen, you gotta leave. And the bird said, no, I'm staying with you. And the fire grew to the point where the bird had to actually start to fly. And if you look, the bird didn't fly away from the fire, but actually flew over the fire. Why? Because it was a lake. And what the bird was trying to do is take little droplets of water and pour them over the fire. And he did this back and forth and back and forth, and there was these spirits in the sky. And, and one of these spirits said, what is that little bird doing? And he became curious, and he turned himself into an eagle, and he followed the bird back and forth and back and forth, and he saw that, that there were little flames on the bird, and that many times he'd get to the flame, and most of that droplet had already evaporated. And the, the eagle said, bird, what are you doing? And the, the bird said, well, I'm trying to help my friends. But you're just one little bird. And the fire even grew while you've been doing this. And, and, and the bird looked at him and said, you know, right now is not a good time for unsolicited advice. <laughs> I'm a little busy. And he kept going back and forth, and the fire increased to where the eagle had to rise to, to not get his feathers burned. And when he saw that, he saw that the bird was actually starting to fly lower and lower. And that eagle was just so moved by that act of compassion that he started to cry. And when a spirit cries, they go back to the sky. And both of the spirits cried and put a, uh, a rain over the forest and the fire just uh, evaporated. Well, we all feel the flames of stress. You feel them, uh, we feel them. The people that we help many times are, are, are feeling them. And guess what? They have the birds and, and, and family of their own. They have people within their forest that, that they're trying to help out as well. And that was one of these things that, that you know, kind of an aha moment when I was reading this book called Polyvagal Theory. Again, I'm a sleep specialist, and this book is not about insomnia. However, I was so surprised about how many disorders of chronic stress 
so many people had the symptoms of insomnia. Even though the book was not about insomnia, every other patient that they were describing in there had that. Well, when we're in stress, our body adapts to survive and our adrenal glands secrete cortisol. And when cortisol is secreted, that actually uh, stimulates our amygdala. The name is not important. The concept is that our amygdala is our fear area. So it stimulates them and it makes a scan for more uh, threats, for more tigers in a bush that aren't there. And when that happens, um, we get this stress response and sometimes we end up uh, sleep deprived. And when we're sleep deprived, we even get more cortisol being secreted. And this is, uh, in, in mindfulness-based stress reduction, this is something that, they, that we talk about, is that we have all of these external events and internal stressors that, that affect our, our mind, body. Um, we get into this fight or flight, and we get into this automatic, uh, just automatic modes of, of survival and stress, hyper arousal, um, and then we internalize some of that stress. Then we have maladaptive coping behaviors, you know, we just work harder, we work through it, um, or we stress eat. Um, and then we break down, and all of this constantly is this cycle that just kind of uh, affects our, our mind and body as well. And uh, again, you know, this is not an insomnia lecture, but this is how I learned about it, is there was a day that I realized, you know what? Insomnia is not a night disorder. There are things that happen all day long that lead to our racing thoughts or that lead to the stress that, that lead to difficulty sleeping. So insomnia is a 24-hour disorder, but it's not just insomnia. Many other diseases and disorders, uh, stress is a 24-hour disorder. You know, and sleep and stress is like oil and water, they don't mix. Um, and think about it, everyone who I know has had a dream that they're falling, and then they wake up. I've never met anybody who finished a dream where they fell, they cracked their head, there's blood, oh, now I gotta go to the ER, and the snowbirds are here, so I gotta wait. No, <laughs> they wake up and they're like, ah, oh, it was just a dream. So how else can we learn to overcome stress? And as I was learning this, I learned about a lot of different techniques that have been validated in stress reduction, from diaphragmatic breathing, meditation, guided imagery, biofeedback. We, we talked about some of these today, and I just want to talk about one more, diaphragmatic breathing. And normally when we breathe, we have a tendency to do what we call chest breathing, but we're just expanding our, our, our kind of chest, and you can feel the, the hinges of, of our ribs kind of move. But in, in diaphragmatic breathing or, or belly breathing, what you do is that as you breathe in, you make your stomach come out, and then exhaling, it comes down. And when you're doing that, you can see the belly's moving. That's why they call it belly breathing. Well, we already talked about the science, about the inhalation and exhalation and how it activates the parasympathetic response, which is our, our, our stress reduction response. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we mentioned is that there were a lot of mood disorders, you know, and in, by 2020, it's going to overtake many uh, disabilities. Many times when we have mood disorders, we have less serotonin in our brain. That antidepressants, they increase our serotonin. And I'm not calling them mind-altering. No, they work, and this is how they work. They increase our serotonin. Now, 10% of our serotonin in our body is in our brain. The other 90% is in our gut. And think about it. You know, if someone's feeling stressed or they're feeling down, what do they do? They'll eat a tub of ice cream. Until what? Until they're full? They were never hungry. No, until the stomach distends. And, and then we get this distension, leads to more serotonin release that can come to our head and we feel happy. Well, it's been shown that if you're doing diaphragmatic breathing over an eight-week basis and you're doing it on a regular basis, that it decreases anxiety scores, that it improves mood and improves sleep as well. So in this situation, the diaphragmatic breathing is kind of like, uh, and other stress responses as well, it's kind of like the lake that helps put uh, uh, flames over the fire. So who's in your force? You know, we're, we're all um, taking care of, of people, and, and this is who's in my force, and I'm not going to stand in this modern society and let flames of negativity uh, go over the force that, because this is who is in my force, my family. And why would I you know, include stories into a scientific lecture? Well, because I thought that it really had a good representation of the stress response, flames of stress, and, and the cortisol. And the other thing is that it's about compassion. And when we show compassion, many disorders also start to uh, improve. Um, another thing is, if you remember, that bird didn't go 
away. You know, the, everyone was saying, hey, go this way. And the brother was like, no, I'm going this way. Where do you go? He went to the lake. He went to nature. Wow. For nature to, to, to heal. Isn't that a novel concept? <laughs> and that's what a, a lot of us are, are trying to do in, in talking about wellness, is letting nature kind of heal our body. And many people will think that we're out on the fringe, kind of like that little bird going the, the opposite way. Well, that bird wasn't on the fringe. That bird went into a, a different frontier. And it's a, it's a new frontier that many of us are doing. And you know, uh, sometimes we're called the nuts and berries person of the, of the family. Um, or, or maybe you all are that as well. Maybe you're organic or paleo or vegan, but we're all doing the, the same thing. We're all trying to uh, allow nature to, to heal ourselves. And we're in this frontier, in this health revolution. And who is it that, that starts revolution? Who succeeds revolutions? Um, it's not those who behave. <laughs> it's not the quiet. It's those who are able to move the human spirit. And that's what we're trying to do today. So you all learned a number of things. If, again, zombies come out today and you ruin the rest of your day, hey, remember, write down that you learned five good things beating stress by building happiness, that practicing de-stressing is an exercise, a box technique, this builds flowers of positivity, orange meditation, this disrupts conversion of uh, negative mood, blowing bubbles, um, deep exhalations are calming, and the diaphragmatic breathing, you know, how to calm the, the mind and, and body. So what do you do now? Well, one thing is, is breathe, and just a simple awareness of the breath, just kind of following and slowing down your, your breathing is going to calm your heart, it's going to calm your mind, it's going to calm your body. We talked about the science behind that. The next time that you're in front of a microwave, don't stand in front of it and tell it to hurry up. <laughs> Turn your back and just follow your breath. Join a yoga studio. I, I heard that you all have a, a yoga instructor over here. That helps uh, the mind and the body. It works. Use modern technology. Go to YouTube and use the keywords John Kabat-Zinn and, and MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. There's a lot of books that you can read, a lot of videos that you can buy, but a lot of it is free and out there on YouTube. Uh, and I did mention there are some books. Buddha's Brain was uh, one that was very important to me in, in this process, and I mentioned some other ones that I'll be happy to, to talk with you all about. And if you want, there's this eight-week course. Sometimes you can go to meditation retreats. Um, I have a family. <laughs> it's hard for me to, to leave for five days to do a medita uh, meditation retreat. But there was this eight-week course that I did uh, online that I would say um, learn a little bit more about meditation first and mindfulness before you do this. This is more kind of like the, the marathon. You know, build your, your, your walking steps first. And remember that when we encourage others to encourage others, we make this world a better place. Uh, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> yes. I have one. Um, because I have trouble going to sleep, I don't have a racing mind at night, but it just jumps around randomly. So yeah. what I've been doing is deep breath in, deep breath out. Okay. And Give out some random books here. You said something about that your exhale should be longer than your inhale, because usually I call it my yoga breathing, it's yeah. real deep, but it's about like eight counts. There you are know, many different time. techniques. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Okay, the, the, question, uh, the question is, um, sometimes there's, there's racing thoughts as we're going to sleep, sometimes it's difficult to get to sleep, and that I mentioned to breathe out longer, um, and there are many different breathing techniques. There are many different breathing techniques that are all effective. But um, uh, again, if we are breathing out a little bit longer than we're breathing in, we have a calming process. Now, you can only do that for so long if we can bring an awareness to your breath, to the breathing, and try to do what you can to at least make them equal, kind of like a, a pulley, a wishing well, where it comes up and it comes down, and just following the airflow coming in and out of, of your nose. And um, that's something that I found to be very helpful. Ours time, there's times that I get called in the middle of the night, whether it's from the ER or the sleep lab, and, and sometimes it's, it's hard to get back to sleep. So this is a technique that I use, just kind of breathing in and out, and I count, but I count backwards. I start at 100, 99, I'm not gonna count all the way to zero, okay? <laughs> but um, it's a technique that 
somewhere you'll start to drift in and out of consciousness and you'll forget what number you're at and when you forget what number you're at just start at 100 again and eventually you'll, you'll fall asleep yeah. yes I think I saw it in one of your slides but in your personal opinion do you believe that negative thoughts and or stress are the primary cause of a lot of people I, I mean primary like a medical doctor yeah. a lot of the ones I've seen are slow to accept that and they might say it's genetic or this and that but are you in what in your research do you think that negative thoughts are the root of a lot of disease primary it's like saying okay is it this or is it that can you repeat the question all right, so do I believe that, that stress is the primary cause of a lot of our diseases? It's contributory. It, can it be the primary cause? It can be. You know, someone says, is it this or is it that? Well, you can have this and that. You can have diabetes, you can have hypertension. These are different, but they both influence uh, brain health and, and stroke. Um, but the stress it really does affect diseases, and they say about 80% of our disorders of chronic disease are influenced by stress. And there is this thing called the placebo effect that, you know, that we put aside. No, don't put that aside. The belief that you're going to get better makes people better, and that's evidence-based. No, uh, um, th it, it works. Unfortunately, many times what we have is the nocebo effect is that people truly believe that they're not going to get better. <laughs> and when you don't believe that you're going to get better, many times people don't. But that was a great question. This one's, I gave a, uh, the sleep diet, novel approach to insomnia. Oh, that's the Magic Ice Cream Palace, yes. which is uh, that's a, a, a book for <laughs> children's sleep. Yes? I have a condition that affects my sleeping. Is there a specific, you were talking about the AD breathing. Is there a specific place to go find how to do that or the best the best website to use for that? Um, I have on my website Paradise Sleep, not just stuff that, that I've put out there of, of an awareness of breath, but links to other different mindfulness places. But I, I also would just recommend uh, YouTube keyword um, John Kabat-Zinn and, and mindfulness. And they did an, an eight-week study and, you know, in this eight weeks where they incorporate mindfulness and yoga and, and, and different types of, of breathing, they showed that a lot of things improved, lowered anxiety scores, and improved uh, sleep as well. Those are all some of the things that they found that, that, were, that were pretty effective there. And do you have any kids or? Yeah. All right, so here's, sometimes I dream of both for infant sleep. Okay. Yes? What is wrong with people who have nightmares very often and who kick and run somewhere in their dream? Yeah, I'm so being chased. The, the question is about nightmares. Oh, I love a good nightmare. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to sound weird when I say that, but um, just like a, a, a washing machine has cycles, our sleep has cycles as well. And people think that when we dream that that is a, a deep sleep, but it's actually a very active brain time. And we're taking today's memories and we're consolidating them into a, a long-term memory. And that is why you may dream of a person you haven't seen in 10 years or a place, a person that you saw a day ago or a place that you were in a day ago. So dreams are also associated with emotions. And many times when we are consolidating today's memories, we, it's kind of like going to a storage shed that you have this new book that you're putting into the storage shed and then you see the table. I haven't seen that table in, in five years. Well, likewise, when your memory area opens up, you will see memories of, of different things that you haven't seen in, in a while. Now, one thing that's really cool is that we can learn to improve our dreams and change our dreams. And that's something called lucid dreaming. And that's actually something that I stumbled upon on, on accident. There was a, a, a night that while I was reading, while I was writing my first book for sleep, there was this night that I couldn't sleep, and I was frustrated, and I was hitting my hand, and I was tossing and turning, and I was looking at the clock, everything that I tell people, my patients not to do. And then I started putting uh, the timer on both of my alarm clocks, and that is when I realized that I was dreaming, because I only have one alarm clock. Mm -hmm. I was 
I spent so much time writing this book about insomnia that I started dreaming that I had insomnia. <laughs> and then what happened after that is I started to learn a little bit more about this and I realized that there is a world out there that, that people can influence their dreams and change their dreams. And now when I realize that I am dreaming, I can, you know, I can change it. And you feel all these different sensations that occur during our dream sleep. But that's why I said I, I, I love a, a good nightmare. <laughs> That was a, a great question. Here's uh, the sleep diet. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can go for it. How do you get a kid to meditate? Like I have a four-year-old. I'm just curious because you said the meditation thing, and I have a four-year-old, and I think that would be really great for her and myself. But you know they're attention is very short yeah so how do you start it how, how do you get a kid to tie their shoes how do you get them to color within the lines you know, know. Ba oh, ba so baby steps <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly it's, it's all it's all baby steps um and uh what i do with some of my patients is that i give them a yo-yo and i go into my bag and i go here here's your yo-yo here's ask them what color is it and they'll tell the color and I will take that yo-yo and put it on their belly button. Now, I don't literally give them a yo-yo. I'm doing exactly what I do in the clinic. And I'll say, okay, now, as you breathe in, your belly button comes up, and then it comes down. Up, two, three, four, down, two, three. What are we doing? Playing through imagination. We're doing yo-yo breathing, and uh, we're, we're working at, at, at their level. Kids have wonderful imagination. And that's what we can do. We start with that. I put on my daughter every night before we go to bed a little stuffed animal on her belly. Okay, as you breathe in, up two, three, four, down two, three, four. The other thing is, have, have, have you ever, as your kid was really young, um, did you teach her how to use the phone before one day she picked up a phone and just imagine and goes, hello? My situation is a little different, so oh. no, I haven't taught her. And, how to do have that. You, I've only had it for three Have months, you ever seen so. a kid pick up a phone and just say hello? Right. Yeah. So that's mirroring. That's mirroring. They see someone doing something and they and they learn to do that themselves. So you want me to put a stuffed animal in my belly and breathe in and out with her while I, she's laying down? I, um, let me rephrase the question. <laughs> I mean, I'll do it. I'm just yeah. I'm really wanting to know. How, how else will they learn? It's it's through mirroring. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I do a normal meditation practice, and there are times that I make it a point and an emphasis to do it when I know that they're gonna be coming down. So now they've, they've seen it. And um, when they go to do it, they'll emulate that. And there, you know, before I even told my son how to do it, there was a day that he would just kind of, what are you doing? I'm meditating, he'll get on the tree and, and do it. Now, a rule, a general rule that I have is don't make a kid do something more than their age. So I don't. I never have my son meditate more for more than six minutes. I have a uh, three-year-old girl. Max, what I do with her is one minute. Max. The other day we actually did two minutes. I was like, wow. Okay, that one. Do they wiggle sometimes? Yeah. You know, but they practice it. And another way that you can get them through meditate is through the magic ice cream palace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. And, and you had a question as well. Yeah, um, so I, I read books a lot before I go to bed. Okay. Is it bad if you read like books that have a lot of violence or does it have an effect on your sleep if you um, read certain books? You know, so let me give you a, a, a different type of, of answer. Let, let me first say that if it works for you, do it. If it's working for you, fine. You know, someone defined wisdom as doing what works. Wow, that's simple, that's great. But now I'm gonna ask you a, a couple different questions, okay? Do you drive? Yes. And I'm not asking hard questions, okay? <laughs> <laughs> when you drive, are you trying to stay alert or are you trying to fall asleep? Stay alert. Okay, I told you, they're not hard questions. <laughs> okay. Um, when you drive, do you sometimes listen to the radio? Sometimes. Sometimes. Can you see how subconsciously you're learning to associate that radio with being alert? If I ring a bell and give a dog food, and I do that every time, one day I ring the bell, I don't bring food out, but the dog still salivates. 
He's learned to, and it's not because I fed the dog the bell. That would be animal cruelty. But the, the, the dog has learned that stimulus. So now going back, you drive, you stay alert, you listen to the radio. Subconsciously, we're learning to associate that radio with being alert. Well, let's just say that you were in bed and you're not asleep. Could you see how maybe it would be a bad idea to bring that, that same radio to bed that you associate with alertness? Okay. Um, you know, the, the question of is it bad for you to, to read before you go to bed, um, it's, it's not really that so much. It's do you associate it with sleep or do you associate it with alertness? Electronics, you know, do people Facebook, do people check their email, do, do they um, watch electronics and TV because it bores the hell out of them or because it stimulates them? If it's stimulating, then don't do it. If it's working for you, okay. Now, I, you know, I, I just mentioned all of these things not to do, you know, electronics. Um, having said that, you know what? There are some times that I use TV to wind down. What? <laughs> I just said not to do that. No, no, no. I said, what do you associate with? And an example is, uh, there's some times that if I need to wind down, I'll watch Star Trek. And it's not, it's not because it bores me. It's because I never watched it as a kid. And then during med school, I would wake up really early. I'd go jogging. I had this really strict regimented day. I'd, I'd just expend all this energy. And at the time, Star Trek Voyager was on. And I would put that on every night at 10 o'clock. And I would fall asleep. To this day, and it's not that, not that I don't like the, the Star Trek, but to this day, whenever I see it, I associate it as a bedtime story. I can't remember when I've ever finished uh, an episode. <laughs> and, you know, so if, if you associate it with, with relaxing, okay. If not, find something else that you associate with, with relaxation. And even though it's a violent novel, I mean, or, or, or reading or, or, or whatever, it, if, if you specifically associate it with your winding down process, wisdom is doing what works. Cool.